Chronic coronary symptoms, it's a new name because until uh, two years ago, we had only stable coronary disease. And the main idea that this changed, and here you see my conflict uh, of interest, it changed in these guidelines, the new 2019 European Society of Cardiology guidelines, in which I had uh, the honor to be one of the reviewers of uh, this uh, paper, which changed a lot on the philosophy. And here we see that what practically ESC wanted to say by changing the name is to give the nature of a dynamic process. Stable coronary artery disease can give the false uh, impression to doctor and patient that it's really stable. Instead, we know that it's a syndrome which has uh, stable and unstable periods. As you can see here, for example, on the bottom with a green line, we see the good scenario, the patient which arrives with an acute event, and after that he's stable and he never goes back in the hospital. Or we have other patients which have recurrent events, and each time they have an event, their total risk increases significantly. So practically, we must see it more as an evolving process in which we need to be always alert instead of looking at it as a stable situation in which we can be relaxed that whatever we did 20 years ago is still good for today. The first part, obviously, like in any disease, is to be able to diagnose it. And what the European Society of Cardiology says is try to assess the symptoms of the patient and perform the necessary clinical investigations. The history of the patient will give us a lot of information in combination with his total risk. A second part is uh, considering comorbidities and quality of life. We know, and you will see later more data on that, that the conservative approach of coronary artery disease is getting more and more credit. And it seems like a lot of revascularizations we did in the past all over the world was probably unnecessary. Was it harmful? No, it's too much to say. But you never need to go on an intervention when you don't really give a benefit to the patient because you just get the intervention complications, which although seldom, they will happen to some patients instead of choosing a more conservative way. Basic exams, which means arresting ECG, basic uh, biochemistry like creatinine, blood count, etc. In some patients, a chest X-ray could help to diaphoro-diagnose between other diseases which cause dyspnea and not pain, and a uh, echocardiography at rest. And then try to assess the pretest probability. If you have a patient with a very low probability, you do nothing, or you go to a non-invasive procedure. If you have a patient with a very high probability, you can go directly to an invasive procedure. And in the intermediate part, which is the majority of patients, you need to choose which test for which patient. And a lot of times, it's not only one exam, but it's a combination of exams that helps uh, us get a result and get a decision on his uh, condition. When we talk about angina, the most classical classification is the uh, Canadian one, in which practically, uh, initially, we talk about sorry, typical angina, which meets the three characteristics, practically, constricting discomfort in chest or neck or jaw or shoulder or arm. It is precipitated by physical exertion and it's relieved by nitrates or rest within five minutes. Atypically, 
when it's two of these characteristics. A non-anginal test pain when it's only one. So practically each time we need to have an idea how typical this is. And the Canadian society makes these four categories only with strenuous exertion, moderate exertion, mild exertion, and angina at rest. Angina at rest practically is of borderline equivalence with unstable angina in uh, clinical practice.